Good afternoon. I'm Rob Curley, editor of the Spokesman Review, and we're about to begin one of our virtual Northwest Passages community forums. Uh, today, we have Representative uh, Kathy Mink Morris Rogers, who is going to be talking with us for uh, uh, 30 minutes. We, uh, please submit your questions. Uh, if you'd like, you can do that on, on our site right below us. And um, I want to get out of the way and, and, and let, 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 let everyone talk. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, one of our senior reporters, Kip Hill, who will be leading the discussion. So thank you both. And, 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 and I can't wait to shut up and listen. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and Congresswoman, thanks for taking time. I know there's a lot going on right now. And I guess that's kind of where I wanted to, wanted to start. What, what are the discussions right now about what a next package or assistance package might look like at the federal level? And when might Congress be acting on that? Sure. Uh, well, the, the discussions are underway right now. Uh, the Senate returned this week. The House has has decided not to. The House has been doing some meetings virtual. Uh, we've been having regular conference calls, Zoom sessions with the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, earlier today, I was on a call with the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So there's a lot of things that are underway. Uh, certainly the impact of the coronavirus, the, the, the public health crisis, the economic crisis, and the multiplier impact of it continues to be felt here in Eastern Washington and all over the country. And, and Congress is discussing what should be next. And, and, I, and I am sure that Congress will be continuing to respond and, and best meet the needs. I think it's important to, to reflect that Congress has already passed four major packages, relief packages in response to the coronavirus beginning uh, early on in March and a big focus on the Paycheck Protection Program, which has been geared towards helping businesses and other entities due to no fault of their own that have been forced to close. So yes, there's a lot going on. I'm, um, one area that I have focused on is with agriculture. Uh, I, am, um, I joined Peter DeFazio out of Oregon to, to ask for the PILT funding and the SRS funding to be made uh, a part of uh, next package. Um, there's also legislation that I've joined with uh, my colleague in Washington State, Kim Schreier, on the, the Farmers Feeding Families Act. But there's a lot underway right now, uh, clearly still responding and anticipating what might be next. Talk a little bit more about those, those agricultural uh, uh, packages. I, you mentioned a couple payments in there. Is the idea to kind of help? I know farmers are... are not really sure what the markets are going to look like when all this kind of reopens and how they get their you know, products to stores and all that kind of stuff. Is that what this is intended to help or what, what, what would those, those changes likely do for farmers here in Eastern Washington? Yes, well, the, the legislation that I mentioned that I'm, I'm leading with Kim Schreier uh, from Washington State, the, the Farmers Feeding Families, that is legislation that would uh, empower our state department of direct uh, agriculture directors to be able to purchase product directly from farmers to be mm -hmm. used in food banks and other areas where uh, we are focused on really meeting fundamental food needs of individuals and families. Uh, so right now, you know, potato farmers, we have a lot of potatoes. Uh, uh, potatoes that normally would be sold to restaurants are, are not, you know, not being sold. We have a lot of potatoes in storage, uh, 3 million tons of potatoes, and, and uh, this would be a way to potentially be able to buy the potatoes and, and get them where the needs are most. And, and farmers have been plowing up potato fields. You've been hearing about that. Dairy farmers uh, you know, um, that are, have milk. Uh, that isn't being distributed. So uh, I think our, our focus right now is to give farmers some, some confidence, some certainty, but also to continue to meet the real needs that people have to be fed. Yeah. If I could ask you specifically something I've reported on and something your colleague, uh, Congressman Newhouse, has, has talked about. Some of these folks that didn't get um, stimulus assistance packages were in fact U.S. citizens, but are, are married to people who don't yet have social security numbers. They have children who are U.S. citizens, but don't have social security numbers. Is that something you've taken a look at? And, and where do you come down on that as, as related to what Congressman Newhouse said? Right, right. We have taken a look at that. 
we we reached out when it was brought to our attention and and it is true that the way the cares act was written uh the twelve hundred dollar uh assistance to the individual if 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 a couple or a family but if they had filed jointly the u.s citizen and then the person that was here uh, maybe on a visa uh the u.s citizen even though they're a citizen and have the social security number would not get that check i think it's a loophole that I would be in favor of correcting to make sure that we uh, those that intended were intended to get, receive that support would get it. Specifically for the U.S. citizen and their child, yeah. uh, the, the, making sure they get that that assistance yes. for that. Yes, because that's what Representative Newhouse said. I know he's had some folks come forward with him because because of uh, migrant populations and workers in uh, in Central Washington. So I just wanted to right. be clear on exactly what that is. Yes. Okay. Um, we look into that too. Yeah. So let me ask you, I mean, there's there's all of this this federal assistance coming down. Um, for a long time, you've been in Congress and, and raised concerns about the deficit and the debt. Is that guiding your thinking at all and how you look at these relief packages that are coming in? And is there a spot where we say we can't we can't provide that assistance anymore because it's going to be a major issue down the line? It is, it is true that we have spent a lot of money. It's unprecedented the amount of money that we have spent and the deficits that we are looking at for this year are record high. Uh, the accumulation of debt, absolutely, it is of concern to me. And I believe that it, um, you know, it, it, it must be addressed. I believe that it, it uh, will have a negative impact on, on us and our children and our, our it will it will reduce our future opportunities. You think about in the future when we want to be uh, investing in infrastructure or, or education or whatever it may be, we'll have these debt payments that we've saddled upon our children and our grandchildren. So I'm absolutely concerned about it. I'm on a budget group of, of members that have been meeting via Zoom over the last few weeks, bipartisan members that are looking at what are some some, some of reforms that we should be promoting right now as we continue to respond to the coronavirus, but make sure that we have some fiscal reforms in place so that we are paying attention to that. Uh, having said that, I would also, you know, part of the reason or the reason that I supported the, the spending and the relief packages is because we have to get our economy. Um, we, have to, we have to take care of our economy. We'll never be able to pay our debt, make our debt payments unless we have an economy that is booming and growing and uh, businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses that have, that have invested uh, a life's worth of work due to no fault of their own had the government come around and close them. And I believed that we, we needed to take action to protect the payrolls, to protect those individuals, as well as uh, help these businesses get through this period of time. And that's why I supported uh, the, the fast relief to try to save as many of those businesses as possible. Let me ask you about, about the economy and, and all of that, because that's become the point of, of some, quite frankly, you know, frustration of people here in Spokane, people in Olympia, people in Washington State concerned about you know how long we've been shut down they've been having protests in in public locations is do you think that people have the right to, to protest those orders from governor Inslee and what what do you think of those protests well well certainly we 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 believe in freedom of speech we believe in freedom of the press and and absolutely people have the right to protest i i think we all have a responsibility to be doing our part to stop the spread and to be wise uh, as it relates to the coronavirus. I was, uh, I'm on regular calls with the governor and I was on a call again with him this morning with the delegation, with the House and Senate members. And I was appealing to him for more flexibility in Eastern Washington in particular. Um, you know, we have voluntarily agreed and have abided by the stay home, stay healthy orders. On Friday, he made the announcement and listed 10 counties that would have the ability to jump to phase two quicker, uh, quite honestly. And I told him, I told him, you know, there's a lot of, still there's a lot of confusion and frustration coming out of his press conference on Friday mm -hmm. because a lot of counties, and I mentioned Stevens County specifically, 
and Whitman County, but also Spokane County, where there's this sense that the, the, that the emergency and the emergency order that the governor has used to impose the, the stay home order, that the emergency doesn't exist in this, and, and that there needs to be more flexibility to look at what's actually happening on the ground and take the appropriate steps. And, and you know, he said, he said Stevens County was especially hard for him, uh, that, you know, they're kind of on the bubble. Uh, but, you know, state, you know, Colville, Washington is shut down. Main Street is shut down right now while the Walmart is open and their parking lot is full. And, and that's where I appealed to him that if he could get the guidelines out so that businesses on Main Street could, could open and operate. If it's limiting the number of people in the business, so be it. If, if you know, I appealed to him for the car dealers, car dealers, you know, the Toyota and Coeur d'Alene is having a record year. Our car, car dealerships are shut down and they've offered guidelines. So maybe by appointment only, or if they clean the car every time, but we want to operate safely, but we need more flexibility right now. And I, and, and the governor said he was working. He was, uh, He's looking at it. Uh, our county commissioners, our public health officers in Eastern Washington, our, our healthcare leaders are, are working right now to figure out, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do safely? And I just uh, hope that the governor will, will, uh, um, will provide even more flexibility to more counties in Eastern Washington. As, as was his response to that, uh, just that we don't have because the, the thing I've been hearing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is one of the concerns about reopening that is we don't have the capabilities to test people to the degree to make it safe at this point. Is that a concern that's been raised and has that been discussed at the state level? Well, certainly uh, that has been a, a long time. Well, from the very beginning, we've needed more testing. We've needed the PPEs. Um, uh, I think in, in Eastern Washington right now, many of these counties uh, have not have not seen the surge that at one point we were preparing for. Uh, we've not seen the numbers that they've seen in eastern or western Washington, in Puget Sound, and Seattle. And the governor the governor um, uh, recognized that he 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 said, you know, we don't we don't we have not seen the hospitalizations, and he said that he was he was. Uh, he told me that he was going to continue to work with the local elected officials and the public health officers and see what flexibility we could put in place here uh, to really uh, respond to what's happening on the ground. And as I talk to hospital administrators, uh, you know, there many of them are anxious to get open again and to be able to do elective surgeries in particular, to be able to expand because uh, they've had to lay off. They've had to lay off doctors and nurses and, mm -hmm. and they, they, uh, people have real healthcare needs that also need to be addressed. So there's trade-offs in all of this. And I think um, I, I think that the governor is hearing from Eastern Washington that uh, uh, it's time for more flexibility. Let me ask you, you mentioned PPE, which has been a big thing. And we have a reader question here uh, okay. from Jesse. Uh, basically, is, is the federal government competing with states for PPP, excuse me, PPE supplies? And what can the federal government do to encourage PPD, PPE production? Right. Uh, so this this has been a a, a state managed res response. So state managed, locally implemented, and federally supported. And I have been on regular calls both with the governor as well as the FEMA uh, uh, regional administrator, and then also with with people in, in DC. So um, whether it's Secretary Azar or the Director of NIH or CDC, uh, at the federal level, the, the federal government has also been, uh, we've used our stockpiles, which weren't nearly enough. No one anticipated this kind of uh, a need, um, but the, the president and the administration has been working to ramp up the production, the manufacturing of PPE and masks in America. It has been, it has been uh, a real wake-up call. Uh, I think everyone has been shocked to learn the vulnerabilities and the weaknesses of our supply chain, and especially our dependence upon China. Uh, that so much of what we we need in medical supplies and medical equipment is now made in China, and. Uh, 
last week I was on a call with Secretary Azar where he was highlighting that we 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 got to get serious about doing more of this in America, but that is part of what's taken so long to ramp up. So you have governors that are purchasing from other countries uh, while the federal government is is all hands on deck, both in the pub on the public side, on the testing, as well as on the private side to ramp up production. Um, since we talked a little bit about world health and all that kind of stuff in that answer, what, there's another question from a reader. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, President Trump's suspension of the funds to the World Health Organization. I know that's something you've addressed. Um, the reader is uh, Robert, and he says he's a proud Spokaneite living in a developing country which was slated to receive assistance money to fight COVID-19 through support of WHO programs. Roger asks, do you believe President Trump's suspension of all funds to the WHO is the most efficient and effective way to create change in the WHO when this assistance is going to direct support of programs in poorer countries? Well, I, I do support the, the president's action because uh, W the World Health Organization, we need to find out what happened. And what the Trump administration has said is that we're gonna suspend the funding until there's an opportunity for an investigation and that we have more, we have more answers. Um, what happened in China and why there was such a delay, why there was false information early on about the coronavirus and how it would be transmitted and why the, the World Health Organization uh, uh, did not expose that and, and did not provide the transparency that we needed. Uh, there's, there's, you know, we need to get some answers uh, because what has happened as a result of early decisions and the decisions that were made and the lack of transparency and the lack of sharing of information with China and, and with the WHO, with the World Health Organization, it has caused it has caused an even more dramatic impact both on our country as well as the entire world. And so I do support uh, the, the administration's action and believe that we need answers. Um, so we shouldn't, we should suspend the funding and up, up until that point. Like, and I think the, the point of, of Senator Risch was, um, who's, who's worked a little bit with the president on this or talked to him about it, was that the idea was that we're not this, suspension of funding is not uh, stopping our response to, to COVID-19. It just is directed through other other paths, maybe through states or something like that. Is that your understanding or? Well, I, I know that that we, we do help countries all over the world and we are helping right now. We are, we, you know, while we are continuing to ramp up and meet our own country's needs, and our needs here in Eastern Washington with medical equipment, medical supplies, PPE and testing, uh, we are also helping other countries around the world. That's happening right now. Let me shift gears just a little bit. One of the things you said it's exposed previously, this virus has exposed sort of our maybe vulnerability in the supply chain for health supplies. I think yeah. one of the other things it's exposed is, is the lack of uh, broadband internet that we have in, in rural areas and that we were kind of behind the curve on that. I know that's something you've addressed in the past. How did how does this you know, crisis, I guess, um, uh, how will that paint our, our discussion about extending that moving forward? And, and what, are, what are you hearing about the, uh, I guess, the, the uh, eagerness now to make sure that some of these rural areas like Stevens County and, and even Ponderay and Ferry counties get, get better access to high-speed internet so we can have these types of meetings in the future? Right, uh, rural broadband was already a priority issue and the coronavirus has only underscored the importance of us closing the digital divide. And it is, it is real uh, uh, on the ground in Eastern Washington. I have talked with superintendents in Eastern Washington who estimate 50% of the kids don't have access to the internet. And as we all recognize, we're, we're doing school at home. I have three school-aged kids at home and you know we're battling for iPads and computer and all that, uh, but we live in Spokane and we, we have internet. And you think about the challenges of not having internet access, not having that broadband infrastructure. Uh, WSU has now, um, uh, they're doing Wi-Fi hotspots 
uh, wherever they have uh, centers. So that's helping meet that need. But telehealth, Congress, Congress um, uh, took action to open up telehealth which was great. So that telehealth would be reimbursed during this coronavirus at the same as uh, any other healthcare procedure. That's great. I was talking with new health systems that provide a lot of the support in, in uh, the northeast portion of Washington state. They said, we have doctors that are, uh, are, are now wanting to be able to use telehealth, but they don't have we don't have the broadband capacity to do video conferencing. So they're still, they're stuck doing telephone um, consultations. So whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's basic uh, business, economic development and our future, clearly this is infrastructure, basic infrastructure that we need. Uh, and the coronavirus has only underscored that. I, I um, worked on legislation that President Trump actually signed just in March that was around, it was called the Broadband Data Act. And it included legislation that I had introduced around the mapping. The maps were all wrong that we were using to allocate precious federal dollars for closing the digital divide. So uh, this legislation is, is going to ensure that our maps are accurate. The maps that we're cur currently using show us, well, show Spokane County is 100% covered. You get, you get outside of the city of Spokane, go south towards Rockford or Fairfield, you don't have to go down there very far and you don't have, you don't have cell phone coverage, mm -hmm. right? Let alone broadband. Mm -hmm. uh, Stevens County, 100% covered. Ferry County, 97% covered. Obviously, they, these maps are not accurate. So that was step one, was to get more accurate maps. And, and, and I would say that this is a huge priority all across the country as I talk to my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, that we must close the digital divide. And uh, this has underscored it more than ever. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I'd like to pop in another reader question here. Um, uh, I know, and I had seen this, but I don't know if, how recent this proposal is, but this question comes to us through uh, Jim Camden, who's our uh, Olympia reporter, uh, former reader. Uh, the president has proposed a payroll tax holiday, and that person is concerned that um, if there is a payroll tax type holiday, uh, you know, the funding for uh, critical federal programs, Social Security, Medicare systems, you know, those might be problematic or skipping the money that might be collected during that holiday. What do you think of that idea? Is that concerning to you? Well, I, I've, I, I know that the president has been talking about a payroll tax holiday. Uh, the, the, the president and his, um, his administration, his team is really looking at proposals that will incentivize people coming out of this time of crisis. So especially uh, small business owners and, and uh, other entrepreneurs and startups. And one proposal is the payroll tax holiday. I want to hear more about it. I want to hear more about the impact that, that it would have on the federal budget and meeting our, you know, obviously how we meet the obligations, not just the, the commitments that we have made in so many of the programs that you just listed. And that absolutely has to be a priority. We have to make sure that we can meet the commitments that we have made through Social Security and Medicare. We have 20,000 people signing up for social security every day right now in Medicare. And so we have the baby boomers retiring and we got to, we got to be able to meet those obligations. So I'll take a look at it. It's, it's one of the proposals that we, that is under consideration and uh, all part of how we, how we take these next steps. Well, let me just ask one, one more question and then I'll let you kind of have any, any last uh, comments you'd have for our viewers, but you mentioned, uh, you know, you're, you your time at home with the kids. My my kids have just downloaded Disney Plus and we're plowing our way through that backlog. What are you doing with your family? What are you reading? What are you watching right now to kind of get if in the few brief moments you have where you're not focused on, on federal policy? Well, we uh, we too, Kip, have uh, recently downloaded Disney Plus. You, you got to get it, right? <laughs> you know, um, I'm, well, I, I should say I'm, I'm quite impressed with how the schools have responded so quickly. And it's uh, given me a, a, 
a renewed appreciation for their teachers and uh, just everything that they provide our kids and making sure that they are learning and growing. And uh, it's certainly challenging having three school age kids at home right now, day in and day out. It's not a quiet, peaceful, relaxing time. <laughs> no, no uh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, our kids, fortunately, the weather has improved and, and we've been a they've been able to get out and do some bike rides and they love to play basketball in the, in the backyard and you know, we're, we're, we're incentivizing them to read. We've been incentivizing them with some financial incentives to read some <laughs> books. And, you yeah. know, sometimes they respond to that better than other days. And uh, uh, they, they, you know, they've been enjoying a program called Duolingo, which is great, which is a, uh, a program that helps them learn another language. So they, they've enjoyed that. And I'm trying to think what other ones uh, um, they like, uh, Pro Progedy. And yeah, I'm learning... I'm learning about some of the new apps that are available to kids, uh, but we do battle screen time and trying to make sure that they are also yep. playing with their Legos and being creative downstairs. Yep. They've, uh, they like to make forts and completely destroy the house. And so, you know, they're being creative though, right? <laughs> so I got to ask you, what was the last thing you watched on Disney Plus? Then? We watched uh, the last one. Let's see here. It was uh, Tangled. Which ah, I mean, yes, the yeah, so we Hansel, watched, right? yeah, that was on Friday night. That was our movie night Friday night. Yeah. Great, great. Well, um, I'll just uh, toss it out to any other messages you want to send. We just got a few more minutes there and then let Rob kind of wrap up here. But anything else you want to let the folks who are watching know that you're working on in Congress right now? Well, sure. Oh, uh, thank you for today. And more than anything, I, I want to just say that this has been a really difficult time. And there's been a lot of loss, a lot of fear. There's still a lot of fear of the unknown. And I, every day, get to hear the stories of American ingenuity and creativity, people in Eastern Washington that are stepping up to meet the needs of their neighbors uh, to help solve problems. Uh, you know, uh, uh, early on, it was a kid in Newport, Washington, who had figured out how on his three-day 3D printer to produce mask, you know, and or uh, dry fly, which I know the spokesman did a story on dry fly and um, um, converting their distillery into hand sanitizer and other other business leaders that have been uh, working to get PPE here and 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 how to convert maybe their operations so that they can produce and, and meet the needs of our community, and that has really been. It's really been inspiring and it's been uh, heartening. And I, I know that we're going to get through this. Uh, this is a time when we're going to have to come together. This has been a huge hit to our, to our country. It's been a huge hit to our, our confidence and uh, that entrepreneurial spirit. You know, we, we've celebrated the risk takers in America in years past and, uh, and right now, those risk takers are taking it really hard. And there's a lot of, a lot of needs. There's a lot of needs. I visited Second Harvest not too long ago and it was a pretty dire report as far as just what they anticipate the needs be, being going into summer. And so my encouragement is that uh, this is a time when uh, we have to be creative to think about how we can help our neighbors and meet those needs. Uh, but uh, it, everything that we can do to provide hope to provide confidence to people so that we can go about our lives and get back uh, to uh, solving problems and um, getting our business running again, the better. And that was part of what I encouraged the governor today was that we, we need that hope, we need that confidence to be able to, to get back and, and really trust people. Yes, we wanna do it safely, but uh, it, uh, we need to be taking those steps. So uh, keep in touch. And let's keep building each other up and uh, believing that tomorrow will be a brighter future. Thank, thank you so, so, so much, Congresswoman, for joining us. And Kip, thank you for, for doing that. We have a, a, a massive lineup of cool Northwest Passages events this week. Um, and, and you know, we, probably the most requested one we've ever had is for our Spokane Health Officer, Bob Lutz, which will be on yes. Thursday. 
and we were returning to our roots as a as a, 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 a glorified book club on Friday when we when we host SM Pulse. So I want to thank all of you who were here and uh, who asked questions and watched and and. And I want to remind everyone that today is is Giving Tuesday, and and if you can give, you should uh, to your favorite charity, your favorite university, what whatever, or give straight to Inovia and let them divvy it up. Um, uh, but I would also have you consider that you should donate to Northwest Passages. All of our events are free, and we do everything we can to to make sure that that we we bring our community together for things like this. So thank you all, and uh, again, Congresswoman, thank you, thank you, Kip, and and I hope we can do this again sometime. Sounds good. All right.